It is uh, with much pleasure that and I can now introduce our next speaker. So it's uh, just started raining outside, but uh, this heavy rain is not at all probably the extreme weather effects that we will hear about right now. Um, the weather, uh, the, the talk uh, that uh, we are uh, being presented um, next uh, will deal with extreme weather effects and how they are linked with climate change and how we even know about that. Our speaker today is Fr Freddy Otto. She's uh, Associated Director of the Environmental Change Institute of the University of Oxford. And she's also the lead author of the upcoming IPCC sixth assessment report, AR6. And without, uh, with no further ado, I give you the stage, ready, please. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, it stopped raining here in Oxford just about, but it's definitely flooded. So that might actually be something um, to come back to um, and talk about with respect to climate change. Um, so. Whenever we hear or whenever um, today um, an extreme weather event happens, we hear about hurricanes, wildfires, droughts, etc. The question that is immediately asked is, was this, what is the role of climate change? And uh, to answer that, for quite a long time scientists gave an answer um, that we cannot attribute individual weather events to climate change but um sorry okay but this because the first the one answer that people were giving uh were that well you can't attribute individual weather events or they were saying in uh yeah in a world where climate change happens of course every extreme weather event is somewhat affected by climate change and the latter is trivially true but that does not obviously provide much information because it doesn't say anything about whether the event was made more likely or less likely or or what the role of climate change was and the first uh, answer that you can't attribute individual events is not true any longer. And this is, an, and, and why that has changed and how that has changed uh, and what we can say is uh, what the content of this talk will be. So ultimately every weather event, extreme or not, is, if you absolutely boil down to it, is unique and they all have many different causes. So there is always a role of um, just the natural chaotic variability of the climate system and climate and weather system that plays a role. It, there's always um, a causal factor in whether the um, where the event happens, whether it's over land, over, um, over a desert, over a city, over forest. Um, but also man-made climate change can have an influence on the likelihood and uh, uh, intensity of extreme weather events to occur. And so what we can say now uh, and what we mean when we talk about attribution of extreme weather events to climate change is um, how the magnitude and likelihood of an event to occur has changed because of man-made climate change. And in order to do that, um, we first of all need to know what is possible weather in the world we live in today. So say we have a flooding event in Oxford and the question is, well, is this climate change or not? So the first question is, um, we need to find out what type or what kind of event is um, the, ra the heavy rainfall event that leads to the flooding. So is it a one in 10 year event? Is it a one in 100 year event? Um, and in order to do that, you can't just look at um, the observed weather records because that will tell you what the actual weather that occurred is, but it doesn't tell you what the possible weather under the same current climate conditions are. And so we need to find out what is possible weather. And to do that, we use 
different climate models. So we simulate under this, the same climate conditions that we have today, possible rainfall events in December in, uh, in Oxford. And we might find out that the event that we have observed today is a one in 10 year event. And so if you then, um, if you do this, look at all the possible weather events, you get a distribution of possible weather under certain conditions, which is uh, shown in the schematic on the slide here in this, uh, in, in the red curve. And then you know that when it rains above, say, 30 millimeters a day in Oxford, then you have a real problem with flooding. So you define that this is your threshold from when you speak about an extreme event. And so you have a probability of this event to occur in the world we live in today. Of course, that does not tell you um, the role of climate change, because in order to know that, you would also you will also need to know what would the likelihood of this event uh, to occur have been without man-made climate change. And so, and but because we know very well how many greenhouse gases have been in introduced into to the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we can actually remove these additional greenhouse gases from the climate models atmospheres that we use and simulate a world that would have been exactly as it is today, but without the greenhouse gases from uh, the burning of fossil fuels. And in that world, we can then also ask the question, What's, what are possible heavy rainfall events in December in Oxford? And we might find that the event um, that we are interested in is in that world, not a one in 10 year event, but a one in 20 year event. And because everything else is held the same, we can then attribute the difference between these two likelihoods of, of occurrence of the extreme event in question um, to man-made climate change. And so with this fake example that I've just used, we would then say climate change has doubled the likelihood of the event to occur because one that was a one in 20 year event is now a one in 10 year event. So that is basically the whole theoretical um, idea behind attributing extreme events. And this method can be used. And so, for example, with our um, initiative that's called World Weather Attribution, we have looked this year at um, the extreme heat in, uh, in Siberia at the beginning of this year that, uh, un amongst other things, led to temperatures above 38 degrees in the city of Verkhoyansk, but also led to permafrost thawing and large wildfires. And that event uh, was made so much more likely because of climate change um, that it's it's almost would have been impossible without climate change. So when we did the experiments and the, you, the models, it's a, a one in 80 million year event in a world without climate change. And it's still a relatively extreme event in today's world but it is possible. So this is the type of event where climate change really is a game changer. Another event um, that, that we have looked at um, is Hurricane Harvey that hit uh, the Houston in Texas in 2017 and caused huge amounts of damage um, with the, the uh, rainfall amounts it, it brought. And um, several attribution studies doing exactly what I've just described, found that this type of, um, so this extreme rainfall associated with the hurricane like Harvey has been made three times more likely because of climate change. And uh, colleagues of mine, Dave Frame and his team have then used this study um, to figure out how much of the economic costs with this hurricane uh, can be attributed to climate change and found that of the 90 billion US dollars that were associated um, that, that were associated with the flood damage from Harvey, 67 billion can be attributed to climate change, which is in particular interesting when you compare that to um, the state of the art economic 
cost estimations of climate change in general, which had uh, on, had estimated only 20 billion US dollars for 2020 uh, for 2017 in the US from climate change. And of course, not every year is an event like Harvey, but it shows that when you look at um, at the impacts of climate change in a more bottom up approach, so looking at the extreme events, which are how climate change manifests and affect people, you get very different uh, numbers as if you just look at large scale changes in, in temperature and precipitation. But of course, not every extreme event that occurs today has been made worse because of climate change. So this is an example of um, a drought in Southeast Brazil that happened in 2014, 2015. Um, where um, we found that climate change did not uh, change the likelihood of this drought to occur. So it was a one in 10 year event in 2014, 2015. And also without climate change, it has this very similar likelihood of occurrence. However, what we did find when we looked at, okay, what else has changed? Why has this drought that has um, occurred in a very similar way earlier in the 2000s and uh, also uh, in, in the 1970s with much less impact, um, we looked at other factors uh, and found that the population has increased uh, a lot over the last or over the beginning of the 21st century, but in particular, the water consumption uh, in, in the area and the water usage has increased almost exponentially, and that explained why the impacts were so large. So this is um, what I've just said is sort of basically the the very basic idea and 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 uh, how in theory these studies work and and how uh, and and some results that we find. In practice, um, it is usually not quite as straightforward because well the idea is, is still the same we need to s use climate models and um, statistical models for ob observational data to simulate possible weather in the world we live in and possible weather in the world that might have been that is in theory straightforward in practice it's often relatively difficult and uh, what you see here is how the results of these studies look when you don't use schematic. And if you're not a hydrologist, this might be a bit of an unfriendly uh, plot, but it's it's basically the same as the schematic that I've showed in at the beginning, um, but just uh, plotted in a way that uh, you can see um, the tails of the distribution particularly well, so where the extreme events are. So on the x-axis, we have the return time of the event in years on a logarithmic scale. And on the y-axis, you see um, the magnitude of the event um, and, and, the, and, and that defines um, what, what our extreme event is. And this is actually a, a real example uh, from uh, heavy rainfall in the south of the UK. And you can see here in red, um, each of these red dots um, that, that you see on the red curve is a simulation of one possible rainfall event in the south of the UK in the year 2015 in the world we live in today with climate change. And the dashed line indicates um, the threshold that led to, um, that led to flooding in, in that year. Uh, and uh, on the x-axis, when you go down from the dashed line, you can then see that this is roughly a one in 20 year event um, in the world we live in today. And all the blue dots on the blue curve are simulations of possible heavy rainfall in the south of the UK in 2015 uh, in a world without man-made climate change. And you can see that these two curves are different and significantly different, but they are still relatively close together. And so the event in the world without climate change would have been uh, a bit less likely. So we have roughly a 40% increase in the likelihood, but still um, other factors like, um, yeah, ju just the chaotic variability of the weather. And also of course, then other factors on the ground where are houses built in floodplains and so on 
play an important role. So um, this is this is the actual attribution step. So when we find out what the role of climate change is. But of course, in order to do that, there are a few steps before that are crucially important and absolutely determine the outcome. And the first step, the first thing to find out is what has actually happened. Because usually when we read about extreme weather events or when we hear about extreme weather events, um, you see pictures in newspapers of flooded parts of the world. Um, and so you don't usually have um, observed weather recordings reported in the media. And the same actually is, is, is true for us. So when we are um, so we work a lot with the Red Cross and uh, they ask us, OK, we have um, this large flooding event. Can you do an attribution study? Can you tell us what the role of climate change is? Then we also just know, OK, there is flooding. And so the first step is we need to find out what is the weather event that actually caused that flooding. And that is not always that straightforward. And this is what you see here on, on this map. Uh, on, on this slide is an, uh, a relatively stark example, but not an untypical. So it's of an extreme rainfall event on the 10th of November 2018 in Kenya. And on the left hand side is one data product of observational data of observational rainfall data that is available. And on the right hand side is another product so the showing the, the same yeah. event. And um, the yeah. The scale, which I failed um, to to sell, say on the slide, Gerne. is in millimeters per day. Um, and so on the left-hand side, you have uh, extreme rainfall of above 50 millimeters per day, which is considering that, for example, in uh, in my home time, town of Kiel in Schleswig-Holstein, um, there is about 700 millimeters uh, of rainfall per year. Um, you can see that 50 millimeters in a single day is very heavy rainfall. Whereas in the other um, data product, you don't see um, as much rain. You still see large rain, but it's not quite not in the same magnitude, and it's also not exactly in the same place. And so, given that most countries in the world do not have an open data policy, cool. so you can't actually get access to the observed station data, but you have to use available uh, publicly available products like the two I've shown here. You have to know and you have to work with experts in in the region to actually know w w who hopefully have access to the data to actually find out what has happened in the first place. But of course, if you don't know that or there is not always A perfect answer so to that question. And, but aufgetaucht. if you don't know what actually your event is, it's very difficult to do an attribution study. Assuming though you have found um, a data product that you trust, um, the next question then is what is actually the right threshold to use for the event? So if it's if you have flooding that was pretty obviously caused by a one day extreme rainfall event, then that would be your definition of the event. But it could also be that the flooding has been caused by um, a very soggy rainy season. So actually the, the really the real event you would want to look at is a much over a much longer time scale. Or if uh, the flooding occurred mainly because of some water management in the rivers and has actually flooded further upstream your spatial definition of the event would be very different. And so, and what you see here on this plot is um, an example of a heat wave uh, in, uh, in Europe in 2019. And there, what usually makes the headlines is the maximum daily temperature. So the, if records are broken, so you could use that as a definition of the event that you're interested in, but of course, what really causes the, the losses and damages from extreme events is not necessarily the one day maximum temperature, but it is when heat waves last for longer, and especially when the night temperatures are also high and not just the daytime temperatures. So you might want to um, look at an event over a five day period instead of just the maximum daily temperatures. 
or and this is sort of why I've shown the um, the pressure plot on on the right hand side, which is really just an illustration. It's not terribly important what's on there, but there are of course different weather systems that can cause uh, heat waves, especially in in the area here in the south of France. It could be uh, a relatively short lived um, high pressure system bringing um, bringing uh, hot air from the Mediterranean, or it could be something that is caused from uh, a long time stationary high pressure system over the whole of Europe. You, w if you want to take that into account, obviously also your event is different. And there is no right or wrong way to define the event because there are legitimate interests in the maximum one daily temperatures, legitimate interests in just a specific type of, of pressure system and uh, interest in what actually causes mort excess mortality on people, what would be the three day or longer type of heat waves. But whichever definition you choose, it will determine the outcome of the study. And here are some typical results of attribution studies. Um, when you look at them in a slightly more um, scientific way and slightly less uh, just the headline way is the ones that I've shown earlier. Because, of course, what also is important is not only how you define the um, the event depending on the impacts um, and depending on what, what you're interested in, the extreme event and what observational data you have available. But of course, there's also then the question of what models, what climate models do we have available? And there's always some trade-off between what exactly caused the event and what we can meaningfully simulate in a climate model. And then all climate models are good for something and bad for other things. So there always need to be um, a model evaluation stage, so where you test if the models that you have available are actually able to stimulate in a reliable way the event that you're interested in. But even if you have done all this, um, it can sometimes be that the models and the observations that you have show very different things. And so the heat wave in Germany uh, in 2019 which was on, uh, which was also on the slide before, is an example of that. Where we, when we look at the long-term observations of uh, of of, extreme, of high temperatures, um, and see how they have changed over time, we find that because of the change in climate we have observed, the likelihood of this type of heat wave has increased um, more. Yeah, about 300 times. So what you see on the, you see this in the blue, the black bar, the black uh, bar in the middle of the blue bar on the left hand side at the very top where it says DWD OPS, that's the Deutsche Wetterdienst observations. And we see that where this black bar is about, uh, again, a logarithmic scale, about 300 times more likely. But of course, because we have only, um, only a hundred years worth of observations, um, and uh, and summer temperatures are extremely variable. There's a large uncertainty around this change, and so we cannot, from the observations alone, we cannot exclude uh, a one hundred thousand times change in the likelihood of this heat wave, but similarly also not a twenty times heat wave. But what the main point is that in all the climate models and all the red bars that you see on there are the same results but for climate models so where we have compared today's likelihood of the event to occur with the likelihood in the world without climate change and you see that the change is much lower and of course climate change is not the only thing that has changed and that has affected observed temperatures but other factors like land use change and, 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 and things like that are much smaller in, in the size than the climate signal. So they cannot explain this discrepancy. So this means that the climate models we have available for this type of study have obviously a problem with the extreme temperatures in, in a small scale. Uh, and there are effects 
that we don't yet understand. And so we can't say, okay, this heat wave was made 10 times more likely, but we can only say um, that with our current knowledge and understanding, we can say that climate change was an absolute game changer for this type of heat wave, but we can't really quantify it. On the right hand side is a much nicer result uh, on the top one, which is for extreme rainfall in, tex in Texas 2019, a nicer result, I mean now for a scientist, so in, in, in a scientific way. So there ha we have in blue two different types of, um, of observations uh, from the heavy rainfall event, and they both show pretty much exactly the same result. Um, and also the two climate models that we had available that passed the model evaluation tests show an increase um, in the likelihood of this event to occur that is very similar to that in the observations in terms of order of magnitude. And so in that case, um, we can just synthesize the results and give an overall arching answer, which is that the likelihood of this event to occur has about doubled because of man-made climate change. And the last example um, that I that, that is here is for a drought in Som drought in Somalia in 2010, where um, not only the observations are extremely uncertain. So from the observations, you could say we could have both an increase in likelihood or a decrease in likelihood by a factor of 10. But also the climate models show um, a very um, a very mixed picture where you can't even um, see a sign that, that is conclusive. So in that case, you can say, well, we can exclude that climate change made this event more or less than 10 times, um, yeah, more than 10 times or less than 10 times more likely, but we can't say anything more. So we can exclude that it's a complete game changer like we have for heat waves, for example, but that's about the only, the only thing that you can say in, for a result like this. So this was sort of the, the most the detailed scientific stuff that I would like to show, because I think it's important um, to get some background uh, behind the, the headline results that, that would just be uh, climate change double the likelihood of this event. So there are always four possible outcomes of an attribution study a priori. And that is because, uh, because climate change affects extreme weather in two ways, basically. One way is what we would call the thermodynamic way, way um, which means that because we have more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the atmosphere overall gets warmer. So you have, on average, an increase in the likelihood of heat waves, a decrease in the likelihood of cold waves. A warmer atmosphere can also hold more water vapor that, me that needs to get out of the atmosphere as rainfall. So on average, from the warming alone, we would also have um, more extreme rainfall. But then there's a second effect, which I call the dynamic effect, and that is because we've changed the composition of the atmosphere, that affects the atmospheric circulation. So where weather systems develop, how they develop and, and how they move. And this effect can either be in the same direction as the warming effect. So it can be that, um, well, we have expect more extreme rainfall, but we also get more low pressure systems bring rain. So you get even more extreme rainfall. But these two effects can also counteract each other. Um, and so if you, if you, ex you can expect more rainfall on average, but if you don't get the weather systems that bring rain, you either have no change in likelihood and intensity, or if the dynamics win, you have actually a decrease in the likelihood of extreme rainfall in a particular season or region. And so this is why a priori, there can always be four outcomes. It can be that the event was made more likely. It can be that it was made less likely. It can be there's no change. Or it can be that with our current understanding and tools, we can't actually answer the question. And so um, this has been possible to do um, now for, for about a decade. 
Um, but only in the last five years really have many, many people or many scientists started to do these studies. And so there is actually a relatively um, large, um, yeah, th there, are, there are lots of attribution studies on different kind of extreme events. And what you can see on this map here is uh, what the um, news and energy outlet Carbon Brief has put uh, all these studies together and you can see in red where climate change made they uh, played an important role in blue where climate change did not play a role and in gray that was an inclusive inconclusive result this is very important though that this is not representative of the extreme events that have happened. This is re just represents the studies that have been done by scientists, and um, and they have um, and they are of course um, biased towards where uh, scientists live and also towards extreme events that are relatively easy to simulate with climate models. So um, there are lots of heat waves in Europe, Australia and North America because that is where people live. And on this next map I have tried to put um, to, to show the discrepancy between the extreme events that have happened and those for which we actually do know the role of climate change. So here um, in red are deaths associated with extreme events since 2003, so since the first event attribution study. And um, it's, it's death from heat waves, storms, heavy rainfall events and droughts um, primarily in different parts of the world. The bubble is always on the capital of the country and the larger the bubble, the more death due to extreme events in those years. And in black overlaying that are those deaths for which we know the role of climate change. So that doesn't mean that they are at, the deaths are attributed to climate change, but it means that they are there, we do know whether or not and to what extent climate change played a role. And you can see that in most uh, of the European countries, the black circle is almost as large as the red one. So for most of the extremes of most of the deaths associated with extreme events, we do know the role of climate change. But for the, um, but for the, for many other parts of the world, there are no or very small black circles. So for most of the events and the deaths associated with them, we don't know what the role of climate change is. And I've used death here not because I'm particularly morbid, but because it's um, it's an indicator of the impacts of extreme weather that is relatively good comparable between countries. So this means that with event attribution methods that we have developed over the last decade, we now have the tools available to do to provide an in inventory of the impacts of climate change on our livelihoods. But we are very far from having such an inventory at the moment um, because most of the events that have happened, we actually don't know what the role of climate change is. And so we don't know in, um, in, in detail and on country and uh, scale and on the scale where people live and make decisions what the role of climate change is today. There's another slightly um, related uh, issue with that is that the extreme events that I've used to create the map I've shown before with the death of climate change, um, with the death of, of extreme weather events, they are from a database called EMDAT, which is uh, a publicly available database where um, losses and damages associated with um, disasters, um, technological disasters, but also disasters associated with weather are recorded. But of course, they only can record um, losses and damages if these losses and damages are recorded in the first place. And so what you see on this map is in grey and then overlaid with different uh, with different circles are um, heat waves that have occurred 
They have occurred between 1986 and 2015 on this map, but you could draw a map from 1900 to today and it would look very similar. And that shows lots and lots of heat, heat wave reported in Europe, in, in the US, India, but there are no heat waves reported in most of Sub-Saharan Africa. However, when you look at observations and also um, we see that extreme heat has increased quite dramatically in most parts of the world and a particular hotspot is sub-Saharan Africa. So we know from when we look at the weather that heat waves are happening, but it's not registered and it's not recorded. So we have no idea how many people um, are actually affected by these heat waves. And so we then, of course, don't do attribution studies and don't find out what the role of climate change in these heat waves is. So in order to, to really understand the whole picture, we would also need to start recording these type of events uh, in, in other parts of the world. And so my very last point um, before I hope that, that you have questions for me is, um, of course, everything I've said so far was talking about the hazard. So talking about the weather event and how climate change affects the hazard. But of course, that is not the same or translates immediately into losses and damages because whether or not a weather event actually has any impacts at all, is lar it's completely driven by exposure and vulnerability. So who and what is in harm's way? And I've already shown um, I've already mentioned the example early on with the, uh, the drought in Brazil, where the huge losses and damages were to a large degree attributable to the increase in water consumption. And, uh, and, and that's therefore, um, in order to really find out how climate change is affecting us today, we not only um, need to define the extreme events so that it, that it connects to the impacts, but also look into vulnerability and exposure, what is changing, what there, uh, and what, what are the important factors. But we can do that. And so we have really made a lot of progress in understanding of how climate change not only affects um, global mean temperature, which we have known for centuries, and, and how it affects um, large-scale changes in temperature and precipitation, which we have also known for a very long time. But we now are, have actually all the puzzle pieces together to really understand what climate change means on the scale, where people live and where decisions are made. We just need to put them together. And uh, one lens or one way of where they are currently put together is for example, in courts. Um, and so, because it's obviously people who experience losses and damages from climate change. And so one way to address that is going through national governments, local governments, hoping for adaptation measures uh, to be put in place. But if that's not forthcoming quickly enough, there is the option to sue and so this is one example uh, which is currently happening in Germany where a proven farmer is suing uh, RWE um, to, to, ba to basically pay their share of um, a adaptation because of a largely increased flood risk from glacier melt in the area and uh, they want RWE to pay from their contribution to climate change via their emissions um, and then have some uh, funding for the adaptation measures from them. And that is one example of where these kind of attribution studies can be used in a very direct way um, to, to hopefully change something in the real world. And with this, I would like to end um, and yeah, leave you with some references and hope you have some questions for me.
Sind wir durch? So, ja, herzlichen Dank für den Vortrag. Ähm, ich habe, äh, bevor wir zum Q&A kommen, muss ich einmal äh, mich <lacht> im Namen der Produktion äh, bei den Zuschauern entschuldigen. Ich glaube, ihr hattet etwas Produktionssound auf den Ohren zwischendurch. Das sollte natürlich nicht so sein. Gut, äh, wir haben jetzt kein, keine Fragen aus dem Chat bisher. Aber vielleicht äh, eine Frage von mir. Ähm, das letzte Beispiel war ja, ähm, war ja ein äh, Fall äh, einer Klage über, über Ländergrenzen hinaus quasi. Ähm, ist das ein Ansatz, äh, den, man, äh, der, der, den wir in Zukunft öfters sehen würden? Das heißt, äh, dass äh, über Ländergrenzen hinweg äh, Menschen oder Organisationen äh, sich gegenseitig versuchen, quasi über den Klageweg auf den richtigen Weg zu bringen? Ähm, also es ist tatsächlich ein, äh, eine Ausnahme, dass das, dass das im Fall ähm, RWE und, äh, und, und ähm, Luya funktioniert. Denn das deutsche Recht ähm, sieht vor, dass Firmen, die in Deutschland ansässig sind, auch für Schäden verantwortlich sind, die nicht in so, Deutschland stattfinden. So, sorry to interrupt, I just realized that we are still in English talk. I, okay, yeah. Sorry for so, that. No worries. Um, so your question was if there, um, if, if uh, we are going to see more international court cases where uh, across countries, across nation states, um, we, we have climate litigation. And this type of litigation that, that I've just shown as the example is, is in so far an exception as uh, in German law, a company is also responsible for the damages caused outside of Germany, which is not the case, for example, for companies in in the US um, or, or so. So, um, and this is why um, Luya sued RWE and not, for example, ExxonMobil. But um, these these type of cases um, where this, this Luya case is an example uh, are, um, we see, A lot of a lot of them, an increasing number of them each year, and um, they are difficult to do across nations because this uh, the German law is ex exceptional in that case. But there are other ways, um, like for example, why human rights courts that that can be done across uh, nations. Uh, states and that that is also happening so it's at the moment it's still legally not super straightforward to to actually win these cases but increasingly a lot of lawyers working on that um, so so that we will see a lot of change on that in the coming years okay thank you in the meantime, there appeared some questions from, from the chat and from the internet. Uh, I will go through them. Um, first question is, are the results of the individual attribution studies published as open data in a machine readable format? <laughs> um, so all the studies that, that we do, um, that, that I've done with my team, with World Weather Attribution, um, so there all the all the data is is available uh, and it's available on a platform that's called climate explorer um, so that should be machine readable um, so and and this is deliberately because um, yeah because we we want to make it as transparent as possible so everyone can go away use our data and redo our studies and um, find out if we've made any mistakes but this is not the case for all the studies that exist because um, a lot most of them or many of them are published in peer-reviewed journals and not all peer-reviewed journals have have open data and open access policy policies but increasingly um, journals have so so if you for example go to the carbon brief um, website and look at the map of studies that you have links to all the studies and a lot of them have the data available 
Okay, maybe a follow-up to this one. Um, the next question is, are the models somehow available or usable for a wide, wider interest public? Uh, or is APC required? I'm not quite sure what a APC means. Um, so the model data is publicly available from, uh, and this is one reason why in we have been able to do these studies because until relatively recently, uh, model data was not publicly available and only scientists working in a specific country could use the model developed in that country. But now all the model data is, is shared publicly and, and people can use it. Um, so it's, it's definitely there and usable. It just requires um, some expertise to make sense of it. But it's, yeah, people can use it. Okay, the next question is, uh, to what certainty can you set up the counterfactual models, which are an important reference to the uh, to your percentage value? Uh, and what data are the base for these models? So the counterfactual um, simulations are, so the, the climate models we use are basically the same models that are used also for the weather forecast. They are just run in lower resolution. So um, which I guess most of this audience knows what that, that means. So the, the data points are further apart so that it's not so computing intensive. And these models, um, they, are, they are tested against observed data. Um, and so that is how we do the model evaluation. So that is then simulations of the present day. And for the counterfactual, we know extremely well, well how many greenhouse gases have been introduced yeah, in included into the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So that there is a very large certainty with that number. And re we remove that from the model's atmosphere. So the models have exactly the same setup, but, um, but, but a lower greenhouse gases, a uh, lower amount of greenhouse gases in their atmosphere, and then are spun up uh, and, and, and run in exactly the same way. So the, but of course, we can't test the counterfactual. And so um, that means that we assume that the the sort of the the weather will still uh, the same physics will still hold in the counterfactual, and that the models that are um, developed using using present day represent uh, the counterfactual, which is um, which is an assumption, but it's not a completely unreasonable assumption because of course we um, we have now. Um, decades of model development and have seen that in, in fact that indeed climate model projections that have been made 30 years ago have actually come um, come to be have been realized in pretty much the same way um, on, on a large scale that they have um, as, as they had been predicted 30 years ago and so that that assumption is not um, yeah it's, it's not a big assumption so the counterfactual itself is not a problem but of course also, the present-day model simulations—they are—they are not—they are very far from perfect, and there are some types of events which uh, state-of-the-art climate models just can't simulate, and so um, where where we can where we can say very little. So, while for example for hurricanes we can say uh, with with red, with high certainty about the rainfall associated with hurricanes, the hurricane strength itself and the frequency of hurricanes is something. Which, which is very difficult to simulate uh, with state-of-the-art models. So uh, our, our uncertainty there is much higher. Okay. Um, and then, well, some uh, one, one question that, uh, that emerges from all this uh, is, of course, if we uh, know uh, this much and way more than, than in the past, uh, how are politicians still ignoring that information and how can we uh, can can we convey that uh, into their uh, minds well if i knew the answer to that i would probably not be standing here um but but actually doing um doing politics but i think um it takes a frustratingly long time for things to change and things should change much faster but we actually 
the last two years have shown huge progress, I think, in terms of also putting climate change on the agenda of every politician. Um, so because, and that's largely due to the Fridays for Futures movement, um, but also to, to a degree, I think, due to the fact that we now actually know that the weather that people experience in their backyard and pretty much independent of where that backyard is, is not the same as it used to be. And so people do experience today climate change. And I think that um, that does help to bring a bit more urgency. And of course, well, I've said everyone has climate change on their agenda, which was very different even two years ago, where there were lots of people who have, who would never talk about climate change and their political agendas has played no role. It doesn't mean that it's it's uh, it has the right priority on uh, on that agenda, but it's still a huge step forward that has been made. And um, so I think we do know some things that do work, um, but um, we just we have to just keep doing that. Um, I, yeah, I don't think I can say more. Uh, I, I don't have a magic wand to change it otherwise. Maybe some uh, some other point of impact. Uh, one of the question is: uh, Is it possible to turn the results of uh, attribution studies into recommendations for farmers and uh, people who are uh, affected uh, in, in a financial way by by extreme weather and how to change agriculture to reduce losses from uh, extreme weather effects? Yes, absolutely. So, so that is one of the one of the most useful things of these studies is, well, on the one hand, to raise awareness, but on the other hand, if you know that a drought that have, you have experienced that has led to losses is a harbinger of what, what is to come, um, then that is incredibly helpful uh, to know how to uh, that agriculture practices might need to be changed or that insurance for losses from agriculture might need to be changed and so this is this is exactly why um why we do these attribution studies because not every extreme event is always uh because of, has always shows the fingerprints of climate change and uh if you if you know which of the events are the ones where climate change is a real game changer, you also do know where to to put your efforts and resources to be more more resilient in the future. And for financial losses, it's um, it is on the one hand, um, yeah, you you can use these studies to find out what your physical risks are for your assets, um, and and how they and of course this everything that I've said comparing the counterfactual with the present, we can do and we do this also with the future. So you can also see how in a two degree world, the, um, the events, uh, likelihood and intensities are changing. And of course, you can then also in a less direct way, use this kind of information to see, to assess what, what might be other risks from where, where might be stranded assets, what uh, what are other risks for the financial um, for the financial sector for the financial planning? Um, what where could liability risks be, and how could they look like? So there is um, because extreme weather events and their changes in intensity and magnitude is how climate change is manifesting. It it really connects all these. Um, all these aspects of where, where where the impacts of climate change are. Okay. Um, last question for today. I hope I uh, can um, get that right. I think the question is um, if there are study uh, if there are studies um, on how. Uh, 
how we cultivate uh, fields um, in, in agriculture, uh, how does this impact um, the the overall um, uh, climate in, in that area? The example here is, uh, is it only an increase in uh, water consumption uh, was uh, uh, directed to Sao Paulo? Or uh, might there also be a, a warm wall created by monoculture in central Brazil? So, um, th yeah. I don't know details, um, but there are, but land use changes and land use does play a role. Uh, on the one hand, it affects the climate. So if you have, um, if you have a, uh, a rainforest, um, you have a very different climate in that location as if there is a savanna or a plantation. And, um, and also, of course, if you have monocultures, um, you're, you're much more, your losses are larger usually as if you have different types of uh, of, of agriculture because um, because in a monoculture everything is in exactly the same way vulnerable and uh, and so that yeah so that that does land use change plays a hugely important role with respect to um, the impacts of of extreme weather and that is one thing to look at when I was saying, talking about looking at vulnerability and exposure. And of course, also changes in the hazard are not just because of climate change, but also because of land use change. And you can use exactly the same methods, but instead of changing the CO2 or the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere of your model, you can change the land use and then disentangle these different drivers in, in hazards. Okay. Pretty Otto, thank you very much for your presentation and for the Q&A. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you with us. And um, yeah, if you have uh, any questions, uh, uh, any more questions, um, I guess there are uh, ways to contact you. I think your uh, uh, e email address and contact details are uh, in the far plan if you uh, for all the viewers that that want uh, that have way more questions. And I, I don't know, uh, do you have uh, access to the 2D world and do you explore that? Uh, given that I don't know what you mean, probably not. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but it would that be, can also uh, be changed. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's the the uh, replacement for um, for the Congress place itself. But anyway, if uh, if you viewers and uh, you people out there have uh, any more questions, uh, uh, contact Freddy Otto. And uh, thank you again very much for your for your talk. And um, yeah, have a nice Congress, all of you. Yeah.